All right, so let's get done with chapter nine. The first um, thing that we're going to do to finish chapter nine is we're going to look at two theorems that help us figure out an easier way to find either um, areas of revolution or volumes of rev surface vo um, surfaces of revolution and volumes of revolution. Basically, the way it goes is that if you take a line segment and you revolve it around an axis, you can figure out an easy way to calculate the surface area of that. Or if you take an area and you rotate it around an axis, there's an easy way to find the volume that you've generated. And it's all related to centroids, and that's why we're looking at it. So, all right, here is the first theorem where we take a line. The green line right here is what we're looking at. And we're thinking about how we would calculate the area if we took this line and we revolved it around this axis right here. So um, we see the little strip right here is our dA. So dA can be written as 2 pi r dL. So dL is the little segment of the line, the total length of the line is L. And so finding the area would require us to integrate, so we would do um, 2 pi r dL. And so this is where the idea of the centroid comes in. The r centroid of this line is going to be given by r dL over the integral of dL. And so if we take this and rearrange it, we could say r dl, the r centroid value is um, times dl is equal to the integral of r dl, which was right up here. And so we can substitute. So here, the 2 pi would have come out. We have our integral of r dl, which could be written as 2 pi r centroid times the integral of dl. And so jumping down here, it says the area can be found as 2 pi r centroid times the length of the segment. And so the idea is that this might be a much easier way for us to do the calculation of the surface area. All we would need to know is the length of the line, the centroid of the line, and then if we rotate it through a complete circle, this is actually our angle theta, how much we've rotated it through. When we go the whole way around, it's 2 pi. And so that's the first theorem, is relating the area to the centroid of the line. Now, our next theorem is going to be related to revolving an area. And as you might expect, it's going to end up be similar. So here is our area and we're going to revolve it around the axis again. Let me just take it around here. And we want to figure out what the volume looks like. Now, um, dV, the little element of volume, and that's this little sort of ring-like shape thing, which has a cross-sectional area of dA, and the distance around is 2 pi r. So 2 pi r dA would give us the total volume of that little element that you see shaded there in the, in the gray. So the volume is that integral, 2 pi r dA. Once again, we're going to think about the definition of the centroid of the area. The centroid of the area would be defined as r dA over the integral of dA. And so we arrange that again r centroid times the integral of dA is equal to the integral of r dA. And we're going to do a substitution up here. So we get 2 pi r dA is equal to um, 2 pi r cent centroid times dA, the integral. And so volume can be written as 2 pi r centroid times the area. And once again, so the idea is that if I know the total area that I was doing revolving and I knew what the centroid was, I could easily find the volume. And that's what those two, um, two uh, 
theorems are about. Well, let's just see in action. So here, we're going to use the second theorem to find the volume generated by the revolving curve around the y-axis. So we're going to take this, and this is going to produce an area shaded right here. And we want to find the volume if we take it and we revolve it around this axis. So it's going to be like a, I think we call it a paraboloid of revolution. And keep in mind that what it's going to be is um, V is going to be 2 pi x centroid times the area. And now keep in mind that's because we're going to measure the centroid from the y-axis. So it's going to have an x value. Um, so the things that we need to find, we need to find x bar. And then we also need to find the area. But keep in mind this will be the denominator when we're calculating x bar, which is the centroid. All right, so let's go to another page where we have a little bit more. Okay, so again, we're going to do this. And um, we need, so we're saying that our volume is 2 pi x bar times area. So we want to know x bar is going to be the integral of x dA over the integral of dA. So we're going to take vertical strips that are going to be at some distance x, and this is going to be our dA. So our dA is going to be written as um, 1 minus x squared is the height, dx units wide. So putting this into my uh, integral of x times 1 minus x squared dx. x goes from 0 to 1 over the bottom is our just 1 minus x squared dx from 0 to 1. And so the top is integrating x minus x cubed dx 0 to 1 1 minus x squared dx So the top integral is going to look like x squared over 2 minus x to the 4th over 4, evaluated at 0 and 1. And the bottom integral is going to look like x minus x cubed over 3, evaluated at 0 and 1. So the top is going to be 1 half minus 1 fourth. The bottom is going to be 1 minus 1 third. So this is going to be 1 fourth, and the bottom is going to be 2 thirds. Keep in mind that that's my area. But x bar is going to be 1 fourth times 3 halves. So that's 3 eighths. My area turned out to be 2 thirds. So the volume, according to the second Pappas Goldenus theorem, is 2 pi times 3 eighths times 2 thirds, because that's the x bar and that's the area. And my threes are going to disappear. It's going to be a four. That's a two. That's a one. And I get pi over two. So I still had to do some calculation, but it certainly wasn't as bad as it could have been. Now let's look a little bit at her. So you probably learned about pressure in general physics. The pressure in a fluid is always... Um, exerts on any of the surroundings. It always presses perpendicularly to the, the, the um, container. Um, pressure is force per unit area. And one of the first things that we do is we figure out the idea that the pressure is something that's going to vary with depth. So the way that we see this is we imagine taking a little piece of a fluid that has a cross-sectional area of A and at the top I'm going to have the atmospheric pressure acting on it. The bottom is just the pressure at this depth and then of course I'm going to have the weight mg acting downward. That's the, due to the weight of the fluid. And so this little piece, I've really taken this element of fluid in this container just um, as an example. It's 
a little piece, but it's in equilibrium because I'm assuming that my um, fluid is at rest. And so the sum of the forces in the y direction are zero. Now, I do have to sort of transfer from the idea of pressure to force. So at the top, there's a force down equal to the pressure of the atmosphere times the cross-sectional area of my little cylinder. Plus, I have the weight mg acting down. And then up, I have the p times a, and that's zero. My sign convention's a little backwards, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter. Um, let's do something with the mass of the fluid. That's related to the density times the volume. And the volume of my fluid is this is v, the height of that cylinder. Now, something nice happens, all my areas drop out, and the pressure can be written as the atmospheric pressure plus rho g g. Now, in our book, they put rho and g together and call that gamma, and so we can write, and remember we call this the gauge pressure? We can write that pressure as gamma G or rho G V. All right. So looking a little, a little bit more, you know, kind of thinking about the idea that what we're finding is that um, our plate, or, or when we're under the water, the pressure actually has a linear increase. That is, as Z increases, so does the pressure or the force that's going to be applied. Oh, they go hand in hand, of course. And so um, what I can do is I can sort of view this as a distributed load where the top of the load is a slanted line um, that depends on Z. You know, it's a linear relationship. And so um, looking at this plate here, I basically, it ends up being um, a trapezoidal volume. because from the side it's a trapezoid and of course it's three dim it's three dimensional the pressure at the low end is gamma z1 the pressure at the high end is gamma z2 the total force acting f sub r is equal to the volume of the loading And the pressure can be said to ask, act at point P, which is the center of pressure. And the center of pressure corresponds to point C, which is equal to the centroid of the volume. And we can also kind of look at it from the side. At, from the side, we can sort of view it as a two-dimensional thing and, um, you know, look at it just from that viewpoint, look at it as a two-dimensional load. And so the force that results is going to be equal to dF, which is going to be gamma Z dA. Again, ask, acting at the centroid. Let's just look at an example. Here we have this problem. Um, this is 10 to the fifth. So here's a rectangular plate under the water. It's two meters under the water. We know the atmospheric pressure, that's the pressure at the surface, is one times 10 to the fifth pascals. And the mass density of the water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. The first thing we ask is what's the maximum pressure um, exerted on the plate by the water? We know this is where P max is going to be at the very bottom. So P max is going to be equal to the atmospheric pressure plus gamma Z, where Z is going to be 5 meters.
So this turns out to be 1 times 10 to the 5th plus um, rho, which is 1,000, times 9.81 times the 5 meters. And this will end up to be 1.49 times 10 to the 5th pascals. That's the pressure at the very bottom of the plate, which is the maximum pressure. Now, the second question asks to find the total force on the plate. And so because the pressure goes as gamma z, what we have to do is take strips of the plate that have um, all the same z value. And so f is equal to p dA. And so when I talk about the pressure, I do need to include the atmospheric pressure plus gamma z. And so then times dA, the dA is going to be, it's two meters wide, the plate is, and then the height of this little strip is dz, so it's two dz. And we're going to integrate from z equals two to five. So when I integrate this, I get the atmospheric pressure times z plus gamma z squared over 2, all this multiplied by 2, and so then I would evaluate it at 2 and 5, so it would be pressure atmospheric times 5 plus gamma by squared over 2, I'm just going to put the 2 out here, minus pressure atmospheric times 2 minus gamma 2 squared over 2. And that, I forgot to do the calculation, but that is going to be my answer for the total force. All right, so that was just a little bit that we had to finish up in order to move on. So good luck with the homework.